Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, symposium today in honor of uh, Congressman John Olver, who uh, I'm sure many of you, or perhaps all of you know. Uh, you can read his bio in uh, the program uh, if you need to do that. I think many people actually don't. Uh, we're very uh, pleased that we could organize this day to talk about just a few of the things where the congressman's uh, support and priorities have made a real difference to the campus. Uh, my name is Mike Malone. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Research and Engagement here, the Chief Research Officer. Um, one of the things that uh, the congressman has always supported is education and research. I think that's how I got elected uh, to say a few things this morning. The, um, let me just say uh, a few things uh, about some of the decisive support that uh, the congressman has provided that's been meaningful to the campus. Many of you uh, here are well associated with the campus and uh, I just wanted to say a few things that are not covered in the program today uh, because we couldn't possibly uh, uh, do justice to 44 years of public service in one day. Uh, some of the things where uh, we have programs today and would not have them without uh, the, the congressman's um, initiatives and support are the Large Millimeter Telescope in Mexico, the Climate System Research Center, uh, seafood safety research, uh, the integrated science building that many of you have seen and the, new, the laboratory science building that's going up behind it, uh, the UMass Transit Bus Facility, uh, a wonderful program in mass landscape connectivity, bioactive foods, geobacter research, one of the best uh, antenna programs in the country, the Center for Advanced Sensor and Communications Antenna, uh, renewable energy studies by the Political Economy Research Institute, I think you will hear about that this afternoon, uh, renewable energy research center in the Mass Crest Center, our, and our collaborations with the uh, other universities in the Holyoke High Performance Computing Center who, that was opened just last Friday, uh, and the uh, Pioneer Valley Life Science Institute in Springfield, just to name a few. Um, so these are very uh, important to our programs because this is a research university. But let me single out another area where the congressman uh, has been a staunch supporter, and that's in financial support for our students. Uh, in particular, Pell Grants, uh, uh, many of you know that I'm not going to touch that. Uh, many of you know that the Pell Grants were in peril late last year, and uh, Congressman Olver was one of the people who stood up and made a difference, along with Congressman McGovern, and had a rally here on campus. He's also been a supporter of TRIO programs uh, that are U.S. Department of Education programs that make a big difference uh, to uh, lots of students at lots of places, not just UMass, but uh, all over the country. So. Uh, I don't th this won't be the first time, but let's say thank you to the Congressman for all of that. And without further ado, I'd like to ask the uh, first panel to come up to the stage and uh, Professor Jane Fountain to come up and um, serve as moderator. Thank you very much. Good morning and welcome to UMass Amherst and to our distinguished symposium for Senator John Olver. Um, I, my name is Jane Fountain and I have the great privilege to be moderating the panel this morning, Transit as a Vehicle for Economic Development. Senator Olver, throughout his career and in particular as chair of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development and related agencies, 
has worked to meet not only the nation's needs for infrastructure, but uh, to obtain funds for transportation projects contributing to job growth and quality of life in Massachusetts. His projects uh, are, are well worth noting here, and they include the very important passenger rail platform in Holyoke, which will be opened in a few years, a dialeride program in North Quabbin, a $15.1 million transit hub in Greenfield, a bike path system that runs through Western Mass. In addition to these types of quite material and important projects, Senator Olver has been a strong advocate for investment in infrastructure, as you know, uh, World Economic Forum, I just returned from one of their summits. They do lots of rankings of countries around the world and show that the U.S. is now 23rd globally in investment. So making these investments is absolutely critical. He's been involved and a huge supporter of high-speed rail transit and in the Knowledge Corridor that would connect UMass Amherst with 31 other colleges and universities in the region. Um, you can see from these projects and from his advocacy and vision that transportation touches so many other areas of life. We'll hear from our panelists on those issues, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. We have an unusual panel this morning, not only in the range of their expertise, but in the fact that all of them are either UMass graduates or UMass faculty. So I think it's the only panel today that is your um, exclusive UMass panel. Um, our first panelist, Linda Dunlavey, is the executive director of the Franklin Regional Council of Governments. During her tenure as executive director, which began in 1999, her organization has grown to 45 employees with an annual operating budget of $4 million. They're recognized as a leader in regionalism across Massachusetts. Among their projects um, are uh, improved safety on Route 2. Those of you who have ever driven on Route 2 will appreciate um, the importance of that particular task. Development of scenic byways, which we have many. Creation of Franklin County's Regional Transit Center. Um, she holds a master's degree in regional planning from our university and a bachelor's degree from Boston College. She'll be our first speaker today. Our second speaker, not in the order you have on your program, is Professor John Kalora professor of civil and environmental engineering and director of the Transportation Center here at UMass. He's an expert on transportation management and operations, and his emphasis has been on emergency vehicles, information technology, and work zone safety. The Transportation Center conducts interdisciplinary research has a number of education programs, as well as outreach beyond the university to work to make the Commonwealth's transportation system sound, both in a financial sense and in the structural sense, both in the present, medium term, and into the future. Dr. Kalor has been instrumental in establishing the university's new transit management graduate certificate program created in partnership with UMass Transit and Hartford-based Connecticut Transit. Congressman Olver helped secure the partnership, the grant, from the U.S. Department of Transportation to fund the program. Dr. Kalura has a master's degree in civil engineering from Villanova University and a PhD in civil engineering from North Carolina State University. Our third speaker this morning comes from the world of art, architecture, and art history. Professor Joseph Kripsinski is an associate professor here at UMass Amherst. He's an interior and architectural designer interested in regional planning and grassroots efforts to build sustainable built environments. 
He's the founding director of the Center for Design Engagement, which is a 5013C that supports engaged research and reflective practice in architecture, particularly for communities in Western Mass, and particularly for those underserved by the architectural profession. Among the local projects that he has pioneered are a movable feast, a food truck that brings fresh fruits and vegetables to low-income communities in the area. He's currently helping to facilitate the conversations about the implications of the return of passenger rail service to Holyoke, particularly in terms of implications for economic and community development in the area around Depot Square. His bachelor's in fine arts degree is from the Parsons School of Design, and his master's degree is from UMass Amherst. Um, each of our panelists is going to give you their presentations, and we should have uh, plenty of time for discussion, for questions, particularly for elaborations from um, our special guest, John Olver. So we look forward to exciting presentations. Linda, I'll ask you to start. Okay, an exciting presentation. Great. Um, I am Linda Dunlavy from the Franklin Regional Council of Governments. Pleased to be here. Pleased to not uh, be speaking about broadband, which I, also, I often am because broadband gives the congressman a headache, I know. So, um, I have been asked to talk about transit. I wonder what I do here. There. I've been asked to talk about transit as a vehicle for economic development and specifically to look back at our collaborations with the congressman and also to look forward for our oppor opportunities and challenges all in the context of sustainability. Um, let me give you a background of where I come from. I work for Franklin County. Franklin County is the most rural county in Massachusetts. We have 72,000 people across 725 square miles. Our smallest town is the town of Monroe with 151 people. The Franklin Regional Council of Governments is the transit planning service for our transit authority, the Franklin Regional Transit, transit Authority and our region. We are the regional planning agency for Franklin County and we provide a variety of municipal services to the municipalities of Franklin County. The history of fixed route transit um, by the FRTA was really routes designed to serve the private schools in Franklin County and specifically the Academy of Charlemont, Deerfield Academy and Northfield Mount Hermon. It was these schools that originally paid the local assessment share of the routes. And because of that, they truly were designed for the private schools. Their schedules matched the start time and end time of the schools, and when the schools went on vacation, so did the fixed routes. So they were not particularly useful for the workforce and for economic development, but served a very important purpose to our county. Since then, we've worked with the FRTA, and the routes are, uh, do provide more service to the workforce, but really, the very first transit route designed for economic development was because of the work of John Olver in his analysis of the northern tier. And if you know Congressman Olver, you know he loves to analyze a good set of numbers. And what he looked at was the census data for years and years and years and realized that many of the towns in his district were among the poorest communities in Massachusetts. And that that was especially true in the northern tier of Worcester, Franklin, and Berkshire County, and that there was a continuous east-west line of among the poorest communities in Massachusetts, from Gardner to Williamstown, and that there was a concentration of poverty in the Athol and Orange area that we really needed to focus on and look at. And if you look at this chart, you can see part of the reason why is that there aren't a whole lot of jobs in Athol and Orange, and that the, com the work and labor force, the jobs, are really in Greenfield and Gardner. 
So John Oliver secured funding to do a feasibility study and root analysis that created the G-Link, which is the Greenfield to Gardner transportation fixed route system. Um, this was designed to bring people from Athol and Orange to the employment centers and transportation hubs of Greenfield and Gardner. One thing that the congressman realized is that the G-Link was a fixed route and by and because of that, it was fixed so that we couldn't reach all of the people in Athol and Orange that needed transit service, that needed to get to the employment centers of Greenfield and Gardner. So he also created, which you referred to of the, the North Quabbin shuttle service, he also created a system to bring people from other parts of Athol and Orange to the G-Link to get onto the buses. This was great for two reasons. One, it provided more service to the residents and workers in Athol and Orange. And two, it helped really establish the route to keep, make sure that it was sustainable. The congressman secured the capital that bought the buses for the G-Link. The Franklin, Franklin County made the decision to use some of its federal transportation improvement program funds and used its congestion mitigation air quality funds for the first three years of operation of the G-Link so that we could really establish the route. In the upper left corner of this, you will see that ridership has steadily increased on G-Link. There was a spike in 2009 when gas prices went up. That dropped off a little bit as gas, ridership dropped off a little bit as gas prices reduced, but with the recession, you can see that ridership is, is increasing again. In 2007, 32,000 riders. In 2012, 39,000 riders. Um, it really is a model of transit as a vehicle for economic development. The congressman has also always recognized the importance of intermodal facilities. In the, in, as a way to expand transit and rail use, but also to really help the fabric of a downtown. Congressman, you've been involved with transit centers in Holyoke, Westfield, Springfield, and Greenfield. Is that all? And Pittsfield. So five transit centers through his career. In Greenfield, Greenfield um, has an urban renewal zone that you see in this picture. What Greenfield wanted to do was revitalize this area of downtown. They were focusing on the redevelopment of buildings in the downtown to make the first floor commercial space more vibrant, but also importantly to use the upper story space. Many of the buildings in this area of downtown had not used their upper, upper stories since about the 1890s. And this was a project, am I in trouble? No, no, no. We're, you're talking about pictures we can't see. That's the problem. Oh. Okay. Well, they look really nice here. <laughs> That's why we want to see them. Sorry. Have you seen none of these? None. I'll go back because they're really nice. Oh, see, hold on, hold on. It's not the computer. It's not the computer. It was just working. Yeah, it was not. Yeah, we were the very first slide here, so that was it. Okay, we're going to pause. Yes, Technical sir. difficulty. Yeah. Look how pretty it would have been. I know. These are beautiful. <laughs> very dark. <laughs> Thank you for telling me I would I'm never have I'm known. sorry. Yeah. I'm really going to wait for the next one. But. You want to tell us about the transit centers? And the, I'll talk about <laughs> Greenfield. You want to talk about the rest? No? If you want to keep going, and then when it, when it okay. comes back up, we'll, we'll I'll let keep you going, know. and then we'll go back, and then you'll have so just, much more context with what I'm saying. Just use this computer. Okay. Um, well, if you saw this, you would see an aerial photo of downtown Greenfield, the urban renewal zone, where we were working to. Now I'm just going to keep being distracted. 
Um, we were working to revitalize this area of downtown. We wanted to deal with the buildings and get the upper stories used for mixed-use development and housing, but we also recognized the importance of having some anchor tenants in this urban renewal zone and identified the Franklin County Courthouse, which is slated to have a $74 million renovation starting in this year, and a transit center in this area. So we wanted to find a parcel that was in the urban renewal zone that hopefully was the redevelopment of a brownfield site and that also had access to passenger rail. And if you could see this, you would know that we found all of those. Um, so we, uh, with John Olver's help throughout the entire process, and it truly was a huge amount of help, we have developed the Franklin Region, no, the John W. Olver Transit Center, which I will tell you about in a minute. Um, we developed the Transit Center, and it really met several of the Congressman's goals looking at community revitalization, looking at community services. The Transit Center now holds the offices of the Franklin Regional Council of Governments and the Franklin Regional Transit Authority. Redevelopment of brownfield sites, green technology, expansion of transit and rail. It really was a beautiful project. So close, we are getting so close. Um, is a beautiful project to be kind of a holistic look at all of John Olver's goals throughout his career. Uh, when we first started talking about this and when Tina and I were working on this, we had a list of probably 20 different state and federal funding sources that we expected we had to cobble together to get this built. And then the federal stimulus funds became available and Congressman Olver really advocated for this project to get federal stimulus funds <coughs> which was supported by Mass Department of Transportation and Governor Patrick. And as a result of that, because of the ARA funds, we truly built a green building. It is the first zero net energy consumption transit center in the country. It has 20, thank you. Thank you, Congressman. It has 22 geothermal wells, a 98 kilowatt PV panel, a wood pellet boiler, chilled beam systems for air conditioning, a solar wall to preheat winter air, daylight modeling was used to determine the perfect placement for the size of windows and skylights, and automatic sensors of everything, from water to shades to lighting, et cetera. Um, and when we picked the parcel, we really did want to be close to, to uh, rail tracks because we were committed to bringing passenger rail back to Franklin County. Again, thanks to Congressman Olver and the federal stimulus program, passenger rail will be returning to Franklin County and to Greenfield for the first time since 1985 and 2014, and the transit center will serve as the passenger rail stop. If you could see the next slide, you would see a really nice picture of the transit center that my brother-in-law took, and you would see that the front of the building now says John W. Olver, because the congressman agreed to have the building named after him, because it really is such a fine example of what the congressman stood for. Holistic, long-term thinking, community revitalization, community service, expansion of rail and transit, brownfields redevelopment, green energy, it is a great and beautiful project, and I'm so sorry you can't see it, but it just gives you a reason to come up to Greenfield and see the Transit Center yourself. So looking at our challenges and opportunities coming before us, number one, of course, is money. Um, money for transit at, this, at the state and federal level is always a problem. Adequate money is always a problem, made even harder when you're looking at transit, transit in rural areas. The other challenge we have ahead is ridership. Despite the great numbers on the G-Link, according to the 2010 census, only 1.4% of the commuters in Franklin County use transit as a regular mode of transportation. And a survey recently of young professionals in Franklin, Hampshire, and Hamden counties by Leadership Pioneer Valley the young professionals surveyed, 89% have never used transit. 
So really, one of our major challenges, especially, I found that especially compelling data for Hampshire and Hampton County too, because PBTA and UMass Transit Service have such great routes and such great service, yet 89% have never used transit. So how we get people to think about transit as an acceptable and good mode of transportation going forward is certainly a challenge for us. And then for Franklin County, um, rural transit planning is very difficult. We have surveyed the residents of Northfield. They want transit service to Greenfield. We have surveyed the residents of Ashfield and Conway. They want service to both Greenfield and to Amherst. But how do we do that? And how do we make it sustainable? And by sustainable in that, in that term, we shouldn't think of sustainable as only being green. When we're thinking about expansion of transit services, there's so many questions we need to ask. Is it financially sustainable? Are we going to simply at, con, contribute to air pollution because we're running a half-empty bus on the road? Are the, is, does the community want the service, and does the community wanting the service mean the community will ride and use the service? And are we going to be able to create something that is important for our workforce and gives more flexibility and opportunity to our workforce and more opportunity to our employers? All of those questions have to be answered when we think about expanding transit and using transit as a vehicle for economic development. And I'm so sorry you couldn't see the pictures. It really is one of the prettiest PowerPoints we've ever put together. And if it comes back, if you want to come on up, we can look at it, but that's what I have for you. Thank you. Professor Kalora. So we'll just leave this in case it we comes will. up. We will improvise. Okay. Okay, good morning, and thank you, Jane. Um, first, uh, I'd like to extend my, my thanks to uh, the organizers, Lee Badger in particular, who uh, asked me to be involved today. And um, actually, when I first heard about the symposium, I thought that, gee, uh, this is an opportunity to not only uh, thank uh, Congressman Olver, but to also again tell the university community here and others about the successes that we've had here in transportation, largely uh, because of the help we've gotten from people like uh, Congressman Olver. Uh, what I'm going to try to do in the limited time that I have is talk a little bit about public transportation and how uh, it uh, impacts the economy. And uh, I guess first I should mention that um, Congressman Olver's uh, accomplishments range from addressing local, regional transit problems to addressing national concerns. And as the chair of the uh, Subcommittee on Transportation Appropriations, uh, you can imagine that he has had an opportunity to be a, a very influential and in particular to help those of us in the five college area and in other parts of Western Mass, ranging from Berkshire County uh, out to Fitchburg and down as far south as uh, Hamden uh, County. Uh, there are many transportation needs. We know that funding is limited, but when you have uh, people who share our concerns like Congressman Olver, um, you get their support and it makes the job a little bit easier. Um, at a very high level, let me mention, when I made reference to his help at the local and regional level, um, you know, he has supported PVTA along with the uh, Berkshire, uh, Berkshire Regional Transit Authority and also the uh, Montachusett Area Regional Transit Authority. Uh, he's uh, also provided a great deal of support, as you just heard from Linda, uh, to those in Franklin County. And this support uh, comes in many forms. Uh, they get capital funding, they get operating assistance. And this comes from the federal government along with state and local governments. But without the federal support, 
it makes it very, very difficult to do much of anything in, in the area of uh, public transportation. Um, at the uh, l national level, uh, as you, I'm sure many of you know, Congressman Oliver has been a real champion in uh, helping the uh, High Speed Rail Group move that initiative along. We know that's not an inexpensive venture, but nor was the interstate system back in the 50s and 60s. And I think that there are many people who realize that the, uh, the whole notion that uh, government is under severe stress financially, you know, we hear every day about budget deficits, um, the fiscal cliff, and all of the, the metaphors that make, it, uh, make you realize how lucky we are to have a person like Congressman Oliver who's gone to bat for us in bringing funds back to, uh, to Western Massachusetts. Uh, just to give you an idea of how these funds have impacted the economy, uh, I'll talk a little bit about our uh, UMass Transit System here, which I'm sure many of you are well aware of, which employs uh, some 200 individuals, many of whom are students, who earn wages, and they spend that money uh, to a large extent here in the five college area. And they support uh, rents through uh, rental housing off campus. And so again, just a, a little bit of a reminder of how um, transportation investments in general, especially in transit, uh, support the economy. And when we think about economic impacts of transit, you know, there can be direct impacts, indirect, and what are also referred to as the induced uh, uh, impacts. And you know, it's clear that when we build the UMass Transit Center here, or the transit center up in Franklin County, or the one down in Holyoke, there were jobs there, initially in construction. But there are also other jobs that are supported later uh, by the expansion of transit services and hiring more transit staff, as well as um, you know, the indirect uh, and induced jobs, which you know, may relate to the Dunkin' Donuts and the subway that also uh, locate near those transit facilities, especially you know, when we're talking about uh, major transfer facilities which facilitate uh, the uh, use of intercity uh, public transportation. Uh, now, when we talk about in economic uh, impacts, it's also important, and knowing that I'm talking to uh, a group here, many of whom are connected to academia, that the workforce is a very important element to pay attention to uh, in transportation. And uh, what is important is that we in transportation education are developing the educational and training programs to prepare uh, those who are entering the profession and for those who would like to make a career in, in transportation. And as was mentioned earlier, uh, uh, Congressman Over was very supportive of the, uh, the uh, certificate program we have here and there are brochures out in the, uh, the corridor on the undergraduate and graduate brochures uh, regarding the details on the, uh, the uh, Transit Management and Operations Certificate Program. And this is an opportunity for students to learn about the opportunities in transportation. And it just so happens that by employing 150 bus drivers every year, many students are learning about uh, the opportunities that are in public transit but what the certificate program does is it builds further on providing certain courses, an internship, so that they can make a more informed decision as to whether they would like to uh, stay in the uh, field of public transit and then to either stay here in the valley or to seek uh, employment elsewhere with the MBTA, New York Metro, and others. And I might mention that over the last 20 years, uh, the, uh, the count is up to about 18 or 19 individuals who started as bus drivers, okay, without the certificate program, that is, start out with bus drivers and ended up staying in the public transit profession and uh, have risen to high positions either as general manager or supervisor in the field. So we think that there's a lot of uh, promise with that program. And I should mention that the Federal Transit Administration, which is funding it, uh, views this as a national model for other uh, college towns. Now, one other uh, point I will make about some of the successes we've had here is in the whole research area where we've started research projects which have ended up 
uh, as deployment activities, which are 24-7. Uh, our, uh, I think, most uh, recent one is uh, in the development of a traveler information system here, better known as the Regional Traveler Information Center, which is housed down at the transit facility. How many here have ever been on the Mass Traveler website? Okay, great. So many of you are well aware of the fact that you can get uh, up-to-date information in real time, as we say, regarding traffic conditions in the area to determine whether, A, you should use a certain route, uh, or B, perhaps you would delay your departure time. And we see these opportunities as ways of building on the research that we do and to train individuals who will later go off and work for a consulting firm or for the Mass Department of Transportation and help them continue to enhance such systems uh, with the knowledge that they've gained here uh, at the university. And lastly, I should mention that, Gov uh, that Congressman Olver was very supportive of our human performance laboratory in which we have a driving simulator. Uh, that effort uh, has been spearheaded by uh, Professor Don Fisher in mechanical industrial engineering. And with his students and ours in transportation engineering, uh, we've built a, a force of individuals who leave here with the background in human factors and transportation to help solve many of the safety problems uh, that exist not only in public transit, but uh, in the auto industry. So again, you can see some of the uh, clear-cut economic impacts that uh, many of the funds that uh, Congressman Oliver brought back to Western Mass have, uh, have yielded. Uh, let me just mention in, in summary that uh, again, in the spirit of the theme of the symposium today, that uh, studies have shown that transit uh, does help build just and sustainable communities, and just in the sense of fair and equitable uh, services which are provided to all uh, individuals in the community. I guess, Lee, you're going to address that subject more under the rubric of social justice at lunch today. Uh, uh, on the notion of sustainability, we know that uh, communities today have to endure day-to-day -day, uh, requests and challenges that are presented to them by their uh, uh, citizenry, and in addition, deal with uh, national and man-made events that, that take place that put further pressure on uh, not just transportation systems, but other kinds of public services. And again, we think that transit does serve in that respect. Uh, transportation, again, provides mobility uh, for all residents as well as for all purposes. And many of those funds that have been brought back here from Washington by Congressman Olver have not only gone to transport people to work every day, but to also meet special needs of those who uh, need uh, special medical care and for those who don't have access to an automobile and are required to uh, uh, choose public transit. And uh, Finally, it's clear that public transit, like other forms of transportation, do contribute to the economy and, in many ways, uh, help uh, improve our environment. And, and lastly, again, uh, again, I think it's, it's clear that Congressman Olver has really been a champion uh, for those of us in transportation, uh, for which we are uh, greatly appreciative. Thank you. Well, out of all the presenters, I don't have a traditional PowerPoint, so I probably don't need this because the slides are going to show are just a bunch of images. But, um, but that's actually fairly clear. Um, uh, my name is Joseph Kopchinski. I'm an associate professor in the architecture and design program here at UMass. And I want to thank Lee and uh, the organizers of this conference, uh, of this symposium, uh, for inviting me to be part of this uh, panel in honor of uh, John Olver's work. Um, I particularly appreciate the name of this symposium, and uh, 
as you can tell, I kind of used it for the title of my presentation here. And I'm, I'm going to take a slightly different approach to talk about transit, transportation, and economic development, because uh, the work that I've been doing more recently has to do with community engagement and how do you engage communities in these conversations about transit and economic development. And um, this idea of building just and sustainable communities is uh, key to my current work and research, this notion of social justice, uh, sustainability, and communities. Right? When we begin to combine all of these, they begin to really make authentic, sustainable communities. And I think it's part of my recent work, and it is definitely part of the uh, legislative agenda that John Olver has had for many, many years. So um, in my remarks today, I'm going to talk about work that I've been doing with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission on the Sustainable Knowledge Corridor. And um, And I imagine that we'll hear more about this project uh, during today's panels. So I'm going to provide a short overview and uh, about what the project is about. But particularly, I'm going to talk about my efforts in civic and community engagement, since that's, that's where uh, my work has been. And uh, first, by discussing some community dialogues that we've had throughout Hampshire and Hamden County last year. And then I'll conclude with uh, some remarks and comments on the uh, Holyoke train platform, which uh, I'm also organizing some community engagement sessions around that development. Um, the slides that you'll see today here are documents. They, they are uh, photographs that we took of uh, community members that were engaged in our sustainable dialogue sustainable community dialogues that we held uh, last year. And we, uh, after the dialogues, we invited people voluntarily, if they wanted to take a photograph with a blackboard that had the words, my community is sustainable when, and they were able to kind of contribute what their vision of sustainability is. I'm going to talk a little bit about these dialogues because it really allowed for a very holistic uh, view of sustainability, a, uh, a view of sustainability where issues of transportation and economic development and housing uh, and education uh, and the environment and food security all kind of came together in these kind of overlapping uh, dialogues that we had. So I think it was a, a, a fantastic opportunity. It was one that I engaged uh, my students in last semester uh, in uh, in, in these dialogues, and I think it was a great learning opportunity for all of us, both uh, the, uh, for myself as a professor, for my students, and for the community members that we engaged with. So let me uh, define a little bit um, what the uh, New England Sustainable Knowledge Corridor project is. I'm sure many people uh, know about it, and uh, so I'll just do a, a little summary and then talk about the civic engagement plan in, in particular. So the project is a three-year uh, regional planning process for the Hartford-Springfield bi-state region. And it's to create an equitable and sustainable future for the Connecticut River Valley. So um, it, was, it involves three, a collaboration of three regional planning agencies, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission here in Massachusetts, and in Connecticut, the Capital Region Council of Governments, and the Central Connecticut Regional Planning Agency. Um, so the project is supported by a Sustainable Communities Regional Planning Grant from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and clearly a program that would not be possible without Congressman Olver's support. So I think that uh, one innovation right away is uh, in working on this project is that it's a bi-state effort. Uh, the, a lot of the, the Sustainable Communities grants that were given out are given to uh, metropolitan regions or areas and I think that the insight here is that uh, borders are sometimes uh, have some flexibility. And to understand the Connecticut River Valley as both uh, going from Hartford to Springfield, it is the very uh, uh, idea of the, the sustainable knowledge corridor, um, or the knowledge corridor as, as being connective in that way that's, that is uh, very important to this project. So the overall goal for the project is to craft a regional plan with specific action items um, 
to creating equitable and sustainable communities throughout the Spy State region. And the plans are in housing, land use, transportation, economic development, the environment, and uh, food security. And as I've heard Tim Brennan, who's the executive director of the Partner Valley Planning Commission, often say, the project aims to plan, do, measure. So it's a planning effort, but it's also about implementation, and it's also about assessment and measure. So while it's a three-year project uh, in terms of its funding, it is also uh, establishing an infrastructure of both implement planning, implementation, and assessment that will last for, for many years uh, to come. So my own small part in this effort, because there's many, many people working on this, and Catherine Rette from the Partner Valley Planning Commission is a, a, a major uh, person in the, uh, in the initiative. My small part in this project is to design the uh, civic engagement and uh, strategy for Hampshire and Hamden counties and address the needs to engage communities in dialogues on sustainability and the built environment that are accessible, inclusive, and that can build capacity for residents to continue to be civically active and civically engaged. So those are the goals that were uh, set for my work on this project. And this particular HUD grant uh, came with a clear emphasis on engaging underrepresented groups, which means engaging people and communities who historically have not participated in the planning process. So I think that was a, it was a, a very large part of the grant description and we took that uh, charge very seriously in designing our materials to, for engagement. So as we uh, started to design this, uh, this process, this engagement process, um, we were aware of the challenges that were before us as well as the, some recent studies that describe the kind of participation gap with underrepresented communities. And uh, the obstacles for participation uh, are many. I probably can have an, an entire panel about that. But uh, if we talk uh, about a variety of circumstances such as language and cultural barriers, um, lack of knowledge on civic processes, the effects of poverty, structural racism, and the digital divide that is present in many low-income and geographically isolated communities. So I think that it, what, one of the aspects that was very important about this project that we recognize, if we looked at the demographic information for what's happening in the Pioneer Valley, uh, and it's something, of course, that's happening nationally as well, that in the last 10 years, we would have a, a reduction of population if it wasn't for the growing immigrant and migrant populations within our area. So the need to engage uh, underrepresented groups in the conversations are very important for the economic development viability of this entire area. So, um, so we saw this as, an, as, a, as a moment and a time to build capacity, because that was really one of, a, one of the key aspects of, of the work that we wanted to do. Um, so I don't have uh, a lot of time this morning to review all the strategies we use to develop our community dialogues, but I did want to uh, highlight one aspect uh, and one key uh, collaboration, and that was with uh, our partnership with the local United Way organizations and their partner agencies. Through the uh, collaboration, and this, this particular image, this is uh, in, the, with, in Springfield, Springfield Partners, which was one of our uh, collaborative partners that we were, came in contact with through uh, the United Way. Um, through those, these collaborations, we were able to conduct 22 community meetings in 15 different community organizations and 13 different municipalities throughout Hampshire and Hamden County last spring. So these were uh, Springfield, Holyoke, uh, Ware, um, Huntington, uh, uh, Westfield, uh, Ludlow. So we, we, we did have, we kind of spread a wide net through Hampshire and Hamden County and try to capture both the, the urban centers and the rural areas that are part of our very diverse region. So through this work, we were able to kind of engage a lot of uh, a diverse range of people as our, as our goals were, uh, who typically didn't participate in previous planning processes. 
But what, something else happened. We broadened our understanding of what under, underrepresented groups means in the region, to not only include people of color, low-income people, and new immigrant communities, but to reach out to the hill towns and Quabbin region in acknowledgment of the unique geographic limits of participation that happens in those areas. And that was an insight that happened in conjunction with United Way and the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, that you know, we, we, uh, th there was an understanding of underrepresented groups that expanded. And I think that was a kind of key insight of our work that we did last year. So to, uh, maybe some, some people know, Agma Sweeney from uh, Westfield. Um, so to bring my points maybe back to this focus at hand, which is this, uh, the issue of transportation and economic development. And, uh, and I, I want to share some insights on what we discovered through the sessions that we had last spring. So our community dialogues had four primary themes. Uh, and this was, this was part of our goal to make this uh, planning process accessible. How do we talk to communities about things that perhaps planners and, uh, and policy wonks will get, but which really need a way to kind of uh, uh, an inroad to have conversations with people who are, who are very affected by these issues. So, the four areas that we, that we engaged primarily were housing, the environment, transportation, and economic development. And um, so I'll, I'll highlight some of the uh, conversation from transportation and economic development. In, in transportation was a key issue in both rural and urban areas, and in both settings, conversations revolved around the challenges of creating a public transit system in an automobile-oriented culture. So Linda you know, pointed to this in her presentation as well, and the issues in Franklin County are also issues in Hampshire and Hamden County, particularly in Quabbin and, and the Hilltown regions. But we also see, saw the challenges even within the cities of Springfield and Holyoke about how one can develop a transportation system that is, that is as effective as possible to serve underrepresented groups. I mean, one of the interesting uh, insights here is that uh, if we did a survey, we haven't done it yet, but we should, of underrepresented groups in terms of their use of transit, you'd find much higher numbers. So if we're talking about a future of transit-oriented development and transit use, we really are looking at the underrepresented groups that we've been uh, dealing with within this project. So I think it's, uh, it's, it, it requires further conversation and further elaboration, but I think there's some, some more work to be done in that realm. Um, so the other thing that's interesting about the community conversation is that people always have lots of ideas. And I think one of our discussions about transportation turned into conversations about car sharing, uh, about community supported mini bus service, uh, and about organizing for transit equity. So there is, you know, that, that New England spirit exists. Uh, and maybe it's uh, even with new immigrant communities, it's, it's, it's a, a do-it-yourself culture, I suppose. And it really, you see it in these conversations that, uh, that, that people are interested in solving the problems that are in front of them uh, and, and, and creatively solving them. So in addition to the, um, the dialogues um, the, on transportation, or, or one of the issues in transportation that was important was access to healthy foods and employment opportunities. So that link that always happens between where the jobs are and how to get people to them. And again, with our work with under, underrepresented communities, we saw this very specifically talked about. Uh, people would mention that their, their inability to get from uh, a place of work to where they live, or an opportunity to work, and they weren't able to get there. So, um, so the the um, let's see. in the economic development dialogues, there was a clear continuum between education, job training, and employment opportunities. So uh, what was interesting about the conversations is that uh, out of necessity, we, we had to create silos to kind of have these conversations. We're going to talk about economic development. We're going to talk about transportation. We're going to talk about education. That doesn't work so well in a community setting. They are the great uh, organizers of this information into a holistic whole. And I think one of the things that's insights that we saw there is that economic development was connected to better schools and job training opportunities and then the jobs themselves. So, uh, so that was uh, one, of, one of the other insights that we had. 
Um, so there's a great deal more that, that can be said about these dialogues, and uh, I'm, I'm, I know I'm getting a, a, a sign here that I, that I need to move a little bit faster. So um, there's definitely areas to research and explore, and particularly around the participation gap. This is uh, within underrepresented communities, and developing multimodal ways to engage people both online and with face-to-face -face interaction. This is one of, one of the kind of, another insight that we had. As we move towards a digital culture where even governance is being um, kind of created in this uh, digital realm, we have to be very aware of the digital divide and, and the digital equity issues that exist. And the intersection between face-to-face -face interaction, which I think is still a very important component, and digital interaction is something that needs further exploration and research. And I'm currently, currently collaborating on a grant proposal with uh, Martha Fuentes Batista from the communications department that looks specifically at these issues. So I think that this is, uh, uh, in terms of our future research, this is some work that we want to work on. So to conclude, I want to just say a few words about the work in Holyoke and the, the uh, train platform that's being uh, designed there. If on one hand, the sustainable community dialogues that I've talked about here um, provide some insights into the priorities and concerns that inform a broad regional sustainability plan, then one can see the catalytic project like the restoration of rail service along the knowledge corridor as an opportunity for concrete steps towards implementation of a vision for a sustainable region. So at the moment, I'm involved in another set of community dialogues in Holyoke that are aimed at envisioning Depot Square. And Depot Square is, is the historic location in Holyoke for train arrivals and departures. And uh, it will be the location of the new and recently funded train platform at the end of Dwight Street. So um, the community dialogues in this case are very uh, more specific, and uh, which is to understand the economic and community development implications that can be sparked by the train's return to Holyoke. The key question that we're trying to answer through this latest community engagement process is, um, how can Depot Square's transit-oriented development, and many of you know that, but that, that is a mix of housing, business, and retail that often evolve around a transit hub, how can this development create the kinds of accessible and equitable transportation and employment opportunities that were identified as key priorities in the broader community dialogues? So how do we bring that broader uh, conversation into some realizable form? And I think transit-oriented development and opportunities like this are one way to do that. So of course this is um, done in many different ways and especially in Holyoke you have uh, the city working on its redevelopment plan and particularly there's the Holyoke Innovation District uh, Group which is looking to identify the economic benefits and opportunities that can be achieved by leveraging the benefits of the new uh, Mass Massachusetts Green High Performance Computing Center. Um, for my part, um, there, there are many things that are happening in Holyoke that are very exciting, and I know that everyone working on projects there are hopeful that they will provide a model for sustainable development in the region, and if not, statewide and nationally as well. For my part, I'd like to see this as a model for sustainable development that is authentically community engaged, and hence points towards a truly just and sustainable community in our region, and a model of sustainable development that would continue to build on the promise and the programs and the projects that Congressman Olver has supported for the many years in the past. Thank you. In a moment, we're going to go to questions and discussion, but just in the uh, because our speakers were encouraged to, to give us uh, visuals and sometimes pictures are worth a thousand words and we had some technical difficulties. I've asked them to just very, very quickly um, show us the, their visuals. So this is a few minutes, but uh, fire up your questions and discussion items because we'll be moving to that very quickly. Okay, I'm back. 
And I think you really would have said ooh and ah to all of these, so I'm giving you this opportunity to do that. Please first note that the bus says John W. Olver. Ooh, thank you. It just keep it going, because it's really nice. Um, this slide was to show you how rural Franklin County is. Thank you, thank you. You don't, you don't have to do it every time. Uh, this is the Franklin County region. This is pictures of the private schools that the transit system used to uh, almost exclusively serve. And then this was that slide that some of you did start to look quizzically at me when I was trying to say that this chart showed you that there were, that the top places of employment were not in Athol and Orange, but in Greenfield and Gardner. Does it make more sense now? Thank you, good. Uh, and this is the chart that again, quizzically, you said, what are you talking about? This is G-Link ridership in the top left corner. Really, you can see the spike of ridership increase as the recession has hit. Um, this is the Greenfield Urban Renewal Zone. The star is the location of the transit center serving as an anchor to the revitalization of this area of downtown Greenfield. This is the uh, transit center and in the middle bottom you can see the PV array that truly is as large as a drive-in movie screen. Um, and this is that beautiful picture of the John W. Oval Transit Center that my brother-in-law took. Oh, it still is dark. Up in the, up in the top there, in the copper, it's, it's kind of uh, drilled in holes that says John W. Olver. And then Franklin County is beautiful. And sustainability, we have to look at it through many lenses. Wouldn't that have been a great presentation? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, just uh, a couple of more points and a few graphics. As I mentioned, uh, Transit investments have many impacts in terms of the economy, ranging from national to local. Uh, st studies have shown that for every billion dollars spent on capital funds, uh, there's something on the order of 24,000 jobs supported annually. And per billion dollars of transit operating assistance, there's something in the order of 41,000. So you can see, uh, again, why uh, Many have supported transit, uh, like other aspects of, of transportation, for the purposes of uh, Im improving our economy. Uh, many of you have seen this bus. Uh, you may realize that uh, a bus of the 21st century uh, that you're looking at here uh, is uh, on the order of $350,000. And this is a uh, diesel powered the more user-friendly buses, which are hybrids, combination of diesel and electric, uh, are in the order of about $500,000. And so you can see that, um, again, investing in transit is not inexpensive, but we think that the uh, impacts associated with such investments uh, outweigh the cost. There's a shot of the uh, multimodal transit terminal in downtown Holyoke. Again, associated with such investments are construction jobs, uh, and then, of course, accommodating expanded transit services, facilitating transfers, improving access to uh, job opportunities, and then again, the indirect and induced uh, impacts uh, related to jobs that might be associated with uh, retail uh, or uh, other kinds of uh, development uh, around the uh, downtown uh, facility. I talked a little bit about our regional traveler information system, which you can access via masstraveler.com. Uh, Paul Schulden has been spearheading that project, uh, and uh, in conjunction with the transit staff here, Jamie Schleicher has um, brought this to uh, actually a national level, where USDOT has um, highlighted this particular investment, partly because it started with a small research investment in combination with the uh, National Science Foundation and U.S. 
DOT. Uh, the Human Performance Lab, which makes use of a driving simulator, uh, again, uh, it was uh, Congressman Olver who helped us um, get this started, and as a result of that capital investment, uh, we've been able to bring in uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in the last five or six years to support students and faculty uh, who uh, have been doing cutting-edge research, focusing on largely teenage driver and older driver challenges, uh, with an emphasis on the whole notion that driver distractions uh, are a huge element now in, in, in highway safety. Uh, I mentioned that we are very proud of uh, providing a national model in the area of uh, uh, certificates for undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, Al Byam, the general manager, is the principal investigator on in this project, and uh, it's been Al's uh, support over the years that has been uh, e enormously important for us to be able to tie a knot with industry uh, so that our students get uh, firsthand experience uh, in, in the transit industry. And finally, in, in closing, let me also mention uh, that uh, Congressman Olver's staff has also been uh, instrumental in helping us along the way. Uh, notably, uh, John Nijelski has been a, a real savior, uh, being directly involved in our MassTraveler.com project and many other uh, opportunities that uh, proved to be very successful. Thank you.